Now the third and last part is going to discuss the physiology of the female reproductive system. Now let's first off introduce the different parts. So we've got the vagina, there's the lower part of the uterus known as the cervix, and then there's the uterus, the fallopian tube or the ovarian duct, and the ovaries. The functions of the ovaries are both the production of the um, oocytes, a process known as oogenesis, plus ovulation, and on the other hand, it has an endocrine function where it secretes the female sex steroid hormones, estrogen and progesterone, and it also secretes a protein hormone known as inhibin. You can see the summary of oogenesis. Um, the process of the oogonia cells, which again are the cells that are going to produce eggs, you can see here that the process is starting in fetal life. These oogonia multiply by mitosis and they differentiate into primary oocytes. Primary oocytes even start the first meiotic division in utero. And a baby girl is born with the primary oocytes stuck in the first meiotic division. It's not until puberty hits and then each month some of these primary oocytes are going to complete the first meiotic division right before ovulation. They will change into a secondary oocyte and the cell that is actually ovulated is the secondary oocyte. The secondary oocyte does not go through the secondary meiotic division unless fertilization occurs. Now you can see here the whole process of the development of the human oocyte and the mature graphian or the mature ovarian follicle. So again here you have the secondary oocyte surrounded by its cell membrane. There is a zona pellucida which is that pale zone surrounding the cell membrane. So these granulosa cells and there are also theca cells. These theca cells are made out of theca externa and theca interna. So there are a lot of cells protecting the secondary oocyte. There's also an antrum with lots of fluid in it. Now what is actually ovulated again is that secondary oocyte. And we'll say, take a look, a deeper look into that in the next slide. But what we want to focus on here as well, besides um, you know, the structure of the follicle, um, so let's take a look here if the sperm would like to, is trying to fertilize that egg. It would have to go through your, the theca externa, or the theca cells, the granulosa cells, the zona pellucida, and the cell membrane of the secondary oocyte. And that's where all of those enzymes that are found on the acrosome cap of the sperm helps with. Now the theca cells produce androgens, and these androgens will diffuse into the granulosa cells that have aromatase enzyme, and that is going to change that, those androgens into estrogens. So let's take a look at the process of ovulation. And I actually took this image from another textbook, so you're not going to find this in your textbook. But it shows how the graphene follicle um, at when it's op when op after ovulation occurs, again, here's your secondary oocyte surrounded with the zona pellucida and some of the granulosa cells. The rest of the graphene follicle will become the corpus luteum or the yellow body. And the corpus luteum secretes pro mainly progesterone. So you'll find that in the first part of the cycle, before uh, ovulation, the graphene follicle produces mainly estrogen, and it is also known as the follicular phase, while after ovulation, the corpus luteum is going to produce mainly progesterone, and it is known as the luteal phase. So let's talk a little bit about the control of estrogen synthesis during the early and middle follicular phases. So luteinizing hormone stimulates the theca cells to make androgens. 
And then those androgens by diffusion will reach the inner granulosa cells. And these granulosa cells will be stimulated by FSH to convert androgens through the action of aromatase enzyme into estrogen. Now this is what a menstrual cycle looks like. And if you guys watch those um, recommended videos, you will find that this is obviously not true for everybody, but this is, um, you know, kind of a generic way of explaining how things work. So a whole cycle that starts from day one, which is the first day of bleeding, all the way through 28 days. Mid cycle or at the day 14, this is where ovulation occurs. And we named that pre ovulation phase, we named that follicular phase because it is um, the graphene follicle is mainly making estrogen, while after ovulation, the luteal, the corpus luteum is mainly making progesterone, and we named this the luteal phase. These are the names of the phases in the ovaries. Now let's take a look at what's going on in the follicular phase. The first, again, very variable, but on average about five to seven days, there is uterine bleeding. Um, so that's what's happening in the uterus. If you look at what's happening in the ovaries, you have multiple follicles that are developing in order to become that mature graphene follicle. It's not until mid follicle, or about day seven, where it becomes clear that one, which follicle is going to become the most dominant one and complete the maturation process while the rest are going to degenerate. So you'll see through, you know, from day seven to day 14, the dominant follicle is going to mature to make that mature graphene follicle that we've talked about. Then when ovulation happens, the corpus luteum is going to start functioning. If pregnancy or fertilization does not happen, um, through those last two to three days, the corpus luteum is going to degenerate, and that leads to the decrease in the amounts of hormones being made by the ovaries that will eventually lead to bleeding again. We named the phases in the ovaries, so follicular phase before ovulation and luteal phase is after ovulation. But what is going on in the uterus? Okay. In the first half of the cycle, in the first week, there is uterine bleeding followed by proliferation of the endometrium due to the effect of estrogen. And we name that phase in the uterus, we name it the proliferative phase. After ovulation, due to the effect of progesterone, there is an increase in the blood vessel supply, in the vasculature, an increase in the glands that are found inside of the endometrium. And we name that phase the secretory phase. So the proliferative phase is the phase in the, in the endometrium, and it corresponds to the follicular phase in the ovaries, while the secretory phase in the endometrium corresponds to the luteal phase in the ovary. And here you can see the graphs of the different hormones and how they change throughout the cycle. I'm actually going to start it from the bottom up. So you can see here again in the ovaries, there's the follicular phase and the luteal phase. So that means in this portion, the first half of the cycle, there is going to be high levels of estrogen. And that's why you can see here, looking at the hormonal levels in plasma, you can see the estrogen levels, and then they go, um, you know, it, it drastically increases right before ovulation. And it is that increase in estrogen that stimulates that LH surge due to positive feedback. And it's that LH surge that will... Um, trigger ovulation to happen. When ovulation occurs, again, the corpus luteum is going to produce progesterone. So you see that progesterone levels um, going way up. And it's not until the corpus luteum degenerates where you can see now that the both the estrogen and progesterone levels are going down and declining. 
And that is why the endometrium is going to be shed, leading to um, bleeding again and starting the cycle all over. Now, the relationship between what is going on in the ovaries and what is going on in the uterus. So we kind of already talked about that, but this is a really good way to take a look at it. So here you can see the ovarian events, follicular phase. You can see the uh, follicle growing until ovulation occurs. You can see the due to the effect of estrogen, you see how the endometrium is thickening through due to proliferation. So in the follicular phase, you have both menstruation and proliferation. While after ovulation, the corpus luteum again is making mainly progesterone, but it also makes a little bit of estrogen. And that leads to the increase in the blood vessels and increase in the secretions in the endometrium. And we call that phase again the secretory phase. So the luteal phase in the ovary again corresponds to the secretory phase in the uterus. Now for the hormonal control of the ovarian hormones, and hopefully you find this, um, you know, is bringing flashbacks of that same image of what is going on in the male system because they are both very identical. So the hypothalamus secretes gonadotropin releasing hormone through the hypothalamal pituitary portal vessels will reach the anterior pituitary, stimulating it to secrete FSH and LH. Through the bloodstream, FSH will reach the ovaries, stimulating the granulosa cells to make estrogen. And remember, granulosa cells make estrogen because it gets the androgens from the theca cells. Granulosa cells have aromatase that will change that andro androgen into estrogen. It also produces inhibin, and inhibin is a protein hormone that by negative feedback is going to inhibit the anterior pituitary from making too much FSH. Now LH coming from the anterior pituitary will stimulate the theca cells to make androgens and remember, these are the androgens that diffuse to the granulosa cells to change into estrogen under aromatase enzyme effects. Estrogen then um, will produce the female sexual characteristics, and it will also produce the changes on the endometrium and other changes that we'll take a look at in a bit. And by negative feedback, will inhibit the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus from secreting their hormones. Now, why is it that those high levels of estrogen that occur right before ovulation lead to that LH surge? It is thought, we're really not sure, but it is thought that low levels of estrogen lead to negative feedback, while high levels of estrogen lead to positive feedback. So you can see here that these large amounts of estrogen coming out of the ovary by positive feedback will stimulate the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus to make their hormones, and it is that LH surge that leads to ovulation. Okay, and then you've got your corpus luteum that again is going to produce progesterone mainly and some estrogen. These are two tables, or this table, I'm not sure if it's one or two slides, but this is the summary of the menstrual cycle in writing, so you guys can go ahead and read that. Um, it has everything that we already talked about. So please go through it and let me know if you have any questions about it. Now, what are the effects of the female sex steroids? So whether estrogen or progesterone. Um, estrogen have a wide variety of different things. Okay, some of these things I would like to focus on. So for example, in the uterus, it leads to a watery cervical mucus. Remember, this is the phase where before ovulation happens. So you, it is basically what estrogen is doing is trying to make it easier for sperms to cross through the cervix so that the cervix um, has a thin, watery mucus. Okay, estrogen stimulates the formation of the outer secondary sexual characteristics like breast growth, fat deposition that occurs in the different parts of the body. Um, it also 
increases the fluid secretion from lipid producing skin glands. So the sebaceous glands are stimulated under the effect of estrogen to make thin lipid or thin sebum, mainly watery sebum. Estrogen has what is known as an anti-acne effect. Okay, so we all have androgens, whether male or female, and that can be um, balanced by the effect of estrogens. So androgen leads to the production of a thicker kind of sebum that lead, can lead to acne, while estrogen produces a thinner kind of sebum, and that's why it's known as having an anti-acne effect. Estrogen also stimulates bone growth, leads to that growth spurt um, that eventually will lead to the increase in the length of the bones, so people get taller, but it will eventually lead to the uh, complete ossification of the um, epiphyseal plates. Estrogen is protective against osteoporosis, and that is why after menopause, when the estrogen levels are low, um, women are more prone to osteoporosis. Estrogen also has a vascular effect, and again, the deficiency of estrogen after menopause leads to hot flashes. Estrogen is protective against atherosclerosis. Another reason why atherosclerosis becomes more common in women after menopause. For the effects of progesterone, well, remember progesterone mainly comes out after fertilization. So we are going to, so the, what the body is trying to do is prepare for a possible implantation of an embryo. It'll start um, increasing the vascularity of the endometrium and increasing the secretions of the endometrium. It'll also start making a very sticky, thick cervical mucus, kind of like a plug to prevent other sperms from reaching, from uh, getting through the endometrium or getting through the uterus. It will decrease the contractions of the fallopian tubes and the myometrium, which is the muscle of the uterus. And it decreases the proliferation of the vaginal epithelial cells, stimulates breast growth, and increases body temperature. And this is how some people actually figure out that they have ovulated. Um, they use what is known as the body temperature technique, where they measure their body temperature throughout every single day throughout the cycle. And ovulation due to the effect of progesterone increases body temperature by about 0.5 centigrade. So it is not a um, major increase, not a fever, so to speak, okay? It's just a slight increase in body temperature. Puberty in females, um, again, it's that trigger. It's the hypothalamus turning on, releasing gonadotropin, releasing hormones. Generally speaking, it is very variable according to family history and genetics and so on, but usually it starts at the age of about 10 to 12 years in females. Minarchy is the very first menstruation, and it is considered the last event of puberty. Okay, so puberty doesn't really start with minarchy or menstruation. It starts where pubic hair starts to grow, axillary hair, um, you know, enlargement of the breast tissue. All of these are steps through, um, of puberty. Minarchy happens to be the last one of the last events of puberty on average in the united states it's about 12 and a half years old again it's very variable according to ethnicity and genetics and family history precautious puberty is where um, there is the premature appearance of the secondary sexual characteristics at a very young age and that is usually due to an increase in gonadal steroid production And this is the end of chapter 17.